thank you all. Um, it's good to be here today among friends, among members of the same tribe. Um, I will say that I am as big a fan of Ben as he is of mine, of me, um, or at least as he says he is of me, is a kind of introduction. Um, I apologize, I'm gonna speak pretty quickly today because there's a lot to cover. Um, I don't know that I'm gonna be able to have time for Q&A, which I hate, um, and I'm going to parachute in and parachute out, which I also hate. I'll give you my contact information at the end. We'll be able to talk. But there's a lot to cover. Um, so Ken was talking about, okay, sorry, Ben. It's tricky. Ben and Ken. <laughs> ben. Ben uh, was talking about uh, um, how things seem, seem to be changing faster than ever. And there's a paradox in education, right? We Things seem to be changing faster than ever, and they don't, don't seem to be changing at all. And I want to note the significance. Today is a special holiday for people among our tribe. It's Groundhog Day. <laughs> so if you laughed at that and it hurt a little bit, then we are definitely members of the same tribe, <laughs> right? So there is something different that's happening, I believe. Um, and I'm not going to pretend to have answers to what is going to happen or what we should do about it or what durable skills are or where AI is going to go. I have some observations, some data, and some hypotheses um, that I think you can do something with, and that's all I can share with you. Um, but hopefully we can begin to figure this out together. So the first thing I want to observe uh, is that we're here, we're not talking about lifelong learning this year. Uh, lifelong learning is, is a weird thing because uh, we've been, I've been going to lifelong learning sessions for my entire professional life and I can't remember a single thing I've learned from them. Um, uh, no offense to the presenters, I'm sure I did learn some things, but they, it doesn't feel like we've made a lot of progress on them. And today, for the first time ever, I am talking at, at a session, I'm attending a session on something called durable skills. That is new for me. And I think it's significant. I don't think it's the next blockchain. I think it's actually something real. Um, and so I wanna talk about, um, first of all, what that means, what, how AI might fit in, um, why um, I'm gonna argue that teaching skills are durable skills, that as we face AI, and the changes that are coming, that what I've learned so far is that the skills that make me an educator are, are skills that make me useful in, in the world of AI. Um, and then at the end, I'm gonna try to squeeze in a few more points about other durable skills and some projects that I'm doing. We'll see if we get that far. So, um, I know this is a weird interpretation of the Ascent of Man. I deliberately left it weird. This is AI generated. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about its weirdness <laughs> in a bit. Um, but I, I just wanna, I wanna start with the observation that lifelong learning wasn't always a thing, right? There was a period of time in human civilization, probably the majority of it. I, I'm, I'm not a, an anthropologist, so I don't know exactly how many years, but maybe 90 out of the 100,000 years you know, there was no lifelong learning in the sense that nobody said, when I was a kid, we didn't have those fancy metal pointy things on our sticks. I had to carve my pointy thing out of a stone with another stone, nap, 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 you know, day after day, right? There wasn't change that took place over the course of a single lifetime that was significant enough for people to say, you know, you need to learn new things. Right? We lived out on the savannah or wherever it is, or wherever we were stupid enough to climb out of the trees and make ourselves targets instead of the gazelles. Right? And we did what we could to survive. But civilization is a machine for collective learning. In my mind, that's what it is. And the two key technologies are transportation and communication. We domesticate the horse, we can go, we can find tribes that are further away, we can trade with them, we can learn from them. We invent language, we invent writing. Now we can communicate with other people. We can communicate, we can learn from people who are no longer alive, right? And this begins to pick up. We build boats, right? 
we build, you know, eventually the printing press. We, we, we invent paper, right? And the pace of our collective learning accelerates and accelerates. And civilization, these communication skills, and trans and communication inventions and transportation inventions, they're a flywheel. And our, our rate of collective learning increases until we reach the point where change, significant change, happens during the period of a lifetime, significant enough that I have to learn new skills in order to keep up, not just with the new lion that's moved in on the savannah, but what's happening around me inside human civilization, right? And at that point, two very, very significant things <laughs> happened in, in human civilization. One was the invention of a phrase, when I was your age, right? <laughs> the other was lifelong learning, right? If that became a thing. Now, since then, maybe that was 5,000 years ago, maybe that was 10,000 years ago, I don't know when it happened. It probably happened at different times in different places, like the Chinese had gunpowder. Like that would be, oh good, that seems like it's significant, right? So, uh, at, at when it happens, right, we, we, since it's happened, in the last five or 10,000 years, we haven't really gotten good at formally supporting it, even today, right? But that flywheel keeps spinning, right? Civilization keeps speeding up. The rate at which we're learning keeps speeding up. And so the rate of change in our lifetime keeps speeding up. And now we've reached the tipping point where we're starting to say the rate of change is much faster than one lifetime. It's now not decades. It's years, and in some cases, it might be months. Right now, we're out on the savanna, and we've got our sticks with a point, with pointy metal tips, and out pops not a lion, not a gazelle, but Elon Musk. <laughs> <laughs> and Elon says, you know, we say, be careful, Elon. We've got sticks with pointy metal tips. And he says, that's cool, I've got lawyers. Um, and I've just purchased this savanna, and we're gonna build a gigafactory. Um, and at that gigafactory, we're gonna build electric cars. No, 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 actually, we're gonna build solar roofs with batteries. Um, maybe we'll build <laughs> pneumatic tunnels that run under cities and between cities and drilling equipment that can drill these tunnels. Um, actually, I think we're gonna build rockets that go, can go to Mars, and on the way, they're gonna launch thousands of satellites in low Earth orbit that can transmit internet to everyone. Mm, maybe we'll build uh, chips that can interface directly between the brain and the computer. Yeah, I'm already bored with that. How about we, um, how about we build uh, a, a computer, a supercomputer, a generative AI that has my sense of humor? Uh, I don't know, whatever it is, tomorrow morning when I wake up, I'm gonna decide what we're gonna build in this gigafactory. And you better show up on day one, ready to build it. And if you aren't ready to build it, my, lawyers are going to evict you. And by the way, that lion you're out hunting, now head of human resources. So, <laughs> unless you want a lawsuit, you're done, right? And Elon walks off with his army of lawyers and his lion, and we're standing there with our sticks with the pointy metal tips, and we're saying, can you use this in a gigafactory? What have we, what, how do we keep up with this, right? How do we keep up with this? What can we learn today that won't be obsolete tomorrow? And by the way, every single one of those ideas that I gave you is a real company that Elon Musk is building or trying to build. More than half of them are failing or will fail or are kind of fake, but even a couple of hits, you know, that's a big deal, right? So, um, 
so we have to figure out what this means, right? And, and the thing that has catalyzed this has been happening. This isn't just something that happened when ChatGPT came on the scene. But ChatGPT made it undeniable. It made it um, uh, obvious, right? So I wanted to tell you a story. Like, let me ask you, how many of you, um, how many of you have played with ChatGPT? How many of you have had multi-term conversations with ChatGPT? How many of you use ChatGPT to solve at least one real problem you were wrestling with? How many use it regularly? Okay, so this is an exceptional crowd. Okay, you're really engaged with it. No, seriously, I mean, I'm sure you've all talked to your relatives about this. And what are you talking about, right? It's a toy. Right. It's a toy, and it hallucinates, <clears throat> by, by which we mean it misremembers. So I guess we all hallucinate. Yeah. I know I do. <laughs> right. So I wanted to come up for, at, at, at this point in the talk, when I agreed to give this talk, um, I wanted to come up with an example of how we use ChatGPT. You all now have your own examples. That's very exciting. It makes this conversation easier. Uh, I wanted to come up with an example, and unfortunately, um, an example arose uh, that wasn't the one I had in mind on my list. Um, uh, not long after I agreed to do this talk, um, my, my little sister uh, had a brain hemorrhage uh, due to a previously undiagnosed aneurysm bursting. And she, um, you know, we're very lucky in many ways, many ways. Uh, the first is her husband is literally a world-class um, EMT first responder. And when I say world-class, what I mean is um, he used to work for a federal first response unit leading and training other first responders. He has literally worked with EMT folks in other countries he was there on 9-11. This guy, he, he knew where the trauma center was. He knew that this was an urgent situation. He could walk into that trauma center and speak to doctors that he had already, that knew him as a professional, as a peer, and be treated as one of their own. And this guy is there 12 hours a day, seven days a week, right? So, Okay, we have that. We have my big sister, the one who's not in the hospital bed. She's a rabbi. She has tons of experience at the bedside. She is an hour and a half away, one direction, which is not trivial, but she's gone down there a few times a week, being at the bedside, sometimes bringing my 90-year-old father with her, right? So we have all that going on. Um, Sharon has support. Um, I am four hours away in Massachusetts. Um, and I take medications um, that uh, impair my reaction time, my perceptions, and make me drowsy. So a drive down the New York Thruway and the New Jersey Turnpike uh, is, a, is a serious thing. For me, I have to plan carefully. The last thing we want is for two Feldsteins to be in the hospital at the same time. And if you know anything about brain injuries, you know we, we don't know much. We just don't know much, right? So I am up in Massachusetts. I am feeling helpless. I am feeling useless. I am feeling in the dark. So my brother-in-law, who among other things is an educator, Right. Um, a few days in, he gets on my little sister's um, Facebook account and starts sharing with all her friends and family daily updates. Like, here's the medical thing that happened today, and here's what it means. Right. And when I say we're lucky in many ways, I am lucky in many ways. I, I happen to be married to an actual uh, brain expert. My wife. Uh, did her postdoc in an fMRI lab in Colombia 
studying uh, adult language and learning in the brain using MRI and EEG. She knows a lot about the brain. Um, and her friend, Amiras, is on faculty in the psychiatry department at Columbia. So I'm getting a lot of help interpreting what I'm hearing, right? Because Chris is great. He's a really good educator. These are short Facebook posts as he's managing a lot. And there's, it's dense, right? And he's writing for multiple audiences. The guy on top of educating family and friends, he's also educating his fellow EMTs about, hey, just remember, brain trauma can present fast or slow. Okay, this guy is Superman, he's Iron Man, whatever, pick your metaphor, right? But I'm taking this in and I am, it's just not in my DNA to accept that I cannot know if my sister is going to live. It's not in my DNA to accept that I cannot know if she is going to be okay. So I am desperate, I'm doing everything I can with these morsels. I'm taking them to the people that I know. And they're great, but they don't have any experience in brain trauma, right? They can tell me where the, the, that the brain actually has a thing called the ventricle. That's not the heart ventricle. They can tell me where it is, they can tell me what it does. They can't tell me what it means when it swells, right? So I happened to, before all this had happened, I happened to have read a study um, conducted by Brown University and Mass General showing that ChatGPT um, could pass the written medical board exam specifically for neurosurgery. So I suddenly had a third expert I could consult with. And I started feeding it Chris's daily updates. And at first, the answers I got were not what I needed. Right? So how many of you know about ChatGPT's profile feature? OK, this is really important. ChatGPT, if you click on your profile, there's a place where you can enter information about who you are, what your interests are, and how, what kind of information, how you like your information, right? In my case, because I've been writing for 20 years on the internet a lot, it, it knows a scary amount about me. It's read most of my stuff, right? I've tested it. I won't, I won't go into it, but it freaked me out when I found out <laughs> how much it understands me, right? And for some reason, it came to the conclusion, having read all my stuff, that I like really long, detailed analyses. <laughs> so it took me a while. And, and by the way, without getting into the technicals, the, chat G, the, the folks that open AI, that developed ChatGPT, they clearly made sure that this feature of the profile is, gets a lot of attention from the model. It really pays attention to what's in there. So I had to convince ChatGPT that, that that's not what I want right now. Okay, I'm gonna give you a piece of information and I only care about three things. One, what does this tell me today about my sister's current health? Two, what does it tell me about her prognosis? And three, what does it tell me about the quality of care she's receiving? That's what I need to know in simple language with enough detail that I can feel confident that I can talk to other family members about it. And I kept feeding it day after day, and the information got better and better. And by the way, this is how ChatGPT is being piloted in hospitals around the country. Not to replace the doctors, right? There's a lot of research going on about how well it stacks up against physician judgment. And it's really interesting. But re Hippocratic Oath, right? First, do no harm. And we need to remember that when we think about putting this software in front of our students, right? Where ChatGPT is actually being piloted in the field is patient education. Here's what the doctor's notes say. Here's what they mean, right? Low probability of getting it wrong. And I can tell you now from experience, it's really good at it once you get it focused on the right things, right? So the answers kept getting better and better, and they enabled me to do things I couldn't do. The first thing they did was they reassured me. I mean, I have a lot of faith in my brother-in-law. But the truth of the matter is, I didn't know him like this. He was the guy I sat next to at dinner. A lovely guy, self-effacing guy, 
loved my sister more than anything, did some firefighting and, you know, emergency rescue stuff, and it seemed kind of interesting, but we didn't, you know, we never really talked about it. I never saw him in action, right? So, and I don't know anything about, you know, when people say, well, that's not brain surgery. Well, this is brain surgery, right? It really is complicated and delicate and requires a lot of difficult decisions in the moment. So the first thing I learned from the daily updates and getting my second opinion from ChatGPT is that Sharon was getting excellent care. Every answer was, yes, this is, the, this is the standard of care. This is the right thing. This is why they're doing this. This is why they're monitoring that. You're doing the right thing. And I have to tell you, I still felt in the dark, but there was a light, right? I could see something. Another thing it enabled me to do, and by the way, how many of you have been in a position where you had to advocate for quality medical care for yourself or a loved one, right? Like that's the way it is. This is a rarity that I don't have to, right? Because I, I, I have Chris and I have an excellent surgical team and they're treating my sister as if she's the relative of one of their own. That's a rarity, right? I am never going into a serious medical condition situation again without consulting ChatGPT or a similar tool. Just not gonna happen, right? So it also enabled me to explain things to relatives. Now, everybody's got their own thing. I am obsessive about this stuff. I need to understand it's my way of coping, right? My, my, my family members, they're different. They're all different. But there are times, like I have to tell my father, who's going down to see her, Dad, when you get there, Sharon's gonna have a new tube in her throat. And I want, to, I want you to know this is a good thing, it's not a bad thing, it, it shows progress. Would you like, how much would you like me to tell you about this? How much do you need to understand to feel comfortable? In order to do that, I really needed to understand the details of that. Right. Now I can do that. Now I can comfort him to whatever level he needs, right? And it actually let me catch some misinformation, right? Which is rare because, again, I've got a superhero down sitting next to my sister protecting her every day. But, so, there's a a shunt, right? So maintaining the right amount of fluid in the brain is really, really important and really, really delicate. Too much and you get pressure. And that's obviously not good for the brain. Too little, it can't function. That, that, that swelling of the ventricle was from too little fluid. The way the fluid flows through the brain is very complex and delicate and a brain injury can change the way it flows. So what they do in a case like this is they, they, they put in an adjustable shunt that allows you to drain the fluid at the rate that the patient needs, which may change over time, right? And they're able to adjust it using a magnet from the outside, which is really cool, right? But so there are two things that came up that worried me. Okay? One was, well, Sharon's going to need MRI care for the rest of her life. She's going to need MRI scans. MRI is a giant magnet. You're not supposed to wear jewelry in the same room with an MRI because it'll rip it off your body. Won't this thing rip the shunt right out of her body if it responds to a magnet? No. Jack GPT says no. These things are shielded. It will have to be recalibrated afterwards, but she will be safe. I checked it with Chris. Chris said, yeah, that's right. It was the first question I asked you. Right. Then, you know, Chris says the shunt will drain into the into Sharon's stomach, which is what the nurse told him. And Chris is brilliant, but isn't know everything, right? And that scares me. We put a hole in, in the stomach, stick a tube in there, and Sharon's had gastric issues in the past. That, that and you're going to drain brain juice into there, right? So I asked ChatGPT about. It. So ChatGPT says no, it's not going in the stomach. It's going in the peritoneum. It's that big cavity where all your guts are. It drains out in there and it gets absorbed through, you know, a, diff a diffuse area and you don't have to put any holes in any major organs. 
I said, are you sure? Because the nurse said the stomach. It said, no, it's not going in the stomach. So I asked Chris. Chris checked. He said, yeah, the nurse probably didn't know how much I know about anatomy and was oversimplifying. It's not going in the stomach. It's going in the peritoneum. That's a perfect example of where, in this case, the right thing would have been done. It was just the wrong way of communicating it, but it could have been the wrong thing being done. Right? So now I, I, you know, I have this, this assurance. So at this point, and Sharon is improving, right? Sharon is improving. We get past the first month when we don't know if she's going to live. We get into the second month where it becomes clear that she's in there, that she's conscious, and we start seeing her respond, right? And at some point, you know, I, I'm starting to like, now I'm, there is a waiting game and I need to keep myself occupied, right? And my way of keeping myself occupied is thinking and analyzing. Right, that's how I keep my nerves calm. So at one point, Chris puts a picture up, like the one you see on the screen, not exactly this one. I'm gonna talk about this one in a minute, but it's very similar to this one. And he explains, this is her respiration support monitor. And he says, you see those waves? This is what they mean. And this is the setting on the machine. And this, you know, it, what we're learning is that Sharon is increasingly able to breathe on her own, right, which is, Something we couldn't take for granted. So um, I thought, okay, I'm going to put this picture into chat GPT, but I'm not going to put Chris's explanation. I'm going to see what comes out. What came out was a longer version of Chris's explanation. Everything he did, just from that picture. Right? So I'm increasingly getting to the point where I'm just like, here's the latest update, no explanation. So it's like I'm texting my friend the doctor and I get back the explanation that I want, right? And so I'm down, I managed to make it down to Jersey again. I'm in the room with, with Sharon. At this point, she's having periods of consciousness and can communicate to a certain degree. She happens to be asleep at this particular moment. I'm, I'm there with Chris. And I ask him, you know, we're talking about AI. And he's very interested in AI because he sees the way it's changing his profession. He's seen some amazing applications of AI worldwide in first response. Like finding victims in a building collapse or a fire, like really serious stuff. And so I say, do you wanna, do you wanna see it in action, right? He says, sure, yeah. So I take this picture and that, Phrase on the top, here's her respiration mon uh, monitor right now. That was my entire prompt. That was all I told ChatGPT. I'm gonna read you part of what it gave back, just a fraction of it, right? Based on the new ventilator readout image you provided, Sharon's respiratory parameters continue to show a stable and controlled panic. That word continue is, means it's referring back to the previous image. Right? It remembers what was on the previous image. The breathing parameters, the positive end ex, uh, expiratory pressure remains at six centimeters H2O, which is a standard setting to prevent alveolar collapse and maintain oxygenation. It's still giving me kind of more than I need, but I, it's giving me what I need, right? Um, fraction of inspired oxygen set at 30%, a decrease from the previous 40% suggesting improved oxygenation as she requires less supplemental oxygen. Sharon is making progress. And I learned that from just giving this picture to ChatGPT, right? Settings, uh, you know, I'll skip a whole bunch, Ven uh, ventilation metrics, uh, minute ventilation, waveforms, um, and then it says, Sharon, the settings and waveforms suggest Sharon is maintaining a good level of spontaneous breathing with support of the ventilator. The decrease in F FiO2 and consistent ventilatory support settings indicate that her lungs are exchanging gases effectively and she's maintaining adequate oxygen levels with less supplemental oxygen. And then it goes on to talk about how her team will continue to monitor this, right? And that, I cannot tell you how that feels to see that, right? I can't tell you. So when we talk about how is AI going to change the world, and we think about that Elon Musk thing, how is this, how is this going to change um, the way medicine is done? I don't know, I don't know the answer, but I've just had a really profound experience 
that makes me think that this is not the next blockchain. Mm -hmm. Something is real here. Um, so I want to talk about flipping the script a little bit because um, you know the question you want to start asking is, okay, not what did the AI do, but what did I do to get the AI to respond? What can I do to get what I need out of the AI? Because it wasn't just a magic box that just instantly gave me what I needed. I had to pull it out of it, right? So what was I doing? What are these durable skills, right? And I suggested to it, well, could they be teaching skills? And it said, yes, they could be. And then it gave me a, a list of seven ideas, you know, some of which were better than others, and it talked about scaffolding, right? And that was kind of what I was doing with it in my conversation with it, I was scaffolding it. Right? And the answers got better because it began to understand more the basic concepts of what it means to be a human worried about another human in a, in a medical situation. It doesn't really understand that. It understands the information needs understanding and scare quotes, right? But I, I asked it, you know, give me an example of what AI scaffolding means, right? How would you, you know, how would you scaffold an AI? Here's what it told me. When prompting, uh, when working for, with a generative AI to produce a statistical report, the process begins with basic prompts. For, for instance, you might start by asking the AI to define key statistical terms or to explain the concept of mean, median, and med median in simple terms. Now, it already knows these things, right? So why is it telling me to tell it this? Okay, once the AI demonstrates understanding of these basics, you can build on these concepts. The next step might involve asking the AI to analyze a given data set and describe its basic statistical process. As the AI successfully responds to these foundational concepts, you can increase the complexity of your requests, moving towards more advanced statistical concepts. Um, and basically what it's telling you is that, number one, it may know a lot of stuff but it doesn't know necessarily what's important at any given moment, right? It, it needs context, it needs focusing. Second, it, while it's really good at figuring out how to do advanced stuff or remembering all of these human cognition words should be considered in scare quotes because that's not what it's doing at all. Um, but it needs to be reminded. It needs to be brought into a world in which it's thinking the way you want it to think, and that is scaffolding. And you need, in this case, in this example, to know how to do statistical analysis in order to, to, to prompt it to do good statistical analysis. Now, you can be naive and ask a naive prompt and get a reasonable answer on some of these things. I've certainly done ask questions about things I don't understand and got useful answers. But if you really want to use this as an expert, you have to be an expert and you have to teach it, right? So by the way, I then said, okay, so give me five, like five analogies for this first slide because I'm giving a presentation to educators. And one of them was mountain climbing. And I said, okay, generate an image. And I was testing to see like how, could, how does it translate visually in its own quote unquote mind what scaffolding looks like? And this is what I got. And it's pretty weird, right? Uh, and that's okay, right? The, I'm, I'm, what I'm doing here is form, uh, formative assessment, right? So I'm probing. What does this thing understand, right? And you can, you can uh, you've all seen it, right? You can think, if you work with a program like Mid Journey, which is another AI program, sort of a cross between AI and the ChatGPT and Photoshop. Like you can you can get it to do exactly the kind of image you want. But I wasn't interested in that. First of all, I'm a terrible visual person. Anyway, second of all, I'm more interested in what the AI understands, right? So when I asked it for an image uh, of formative assessment and it gave me the example of a cook tasting, I wanted to see what it thought would be a good slide, right? This is a terrible slide, right? It's not very good at visualizing, right? What we need to understand. So I said, look, you know, this, I'm still interested in formative assessment. I don't want, I'm not interested in creating the perfect image, right? So I said, well, look, you know, this is very cluttered and uh, I, as a user, want to get the core concept. So imagine that, I use the word imagine with it. Imagine that I gave you the image rather than you generating it for me, what would be parsable for you? What would make sense for you 
um, to convey this core concept, and it gave me this. And it very, I'm going to anthropomorphize it and say proudly, um, told me that it had put in a tasting dish, because that really gets at the core concept of formative assessment. Now, I, I didn't want to make you feel bad by telling you I couldn't tell that's a tasting dish. I mean, maybe Google Bard would look at that and say, oh, that's a tasting dish, right? So, but I did want to say, to it, there's, there's no AI in here, right? So what, can you make this analogy here and, and add AI? And it gave me this. <laughs> right. Right. So I said, look, as a human with human perception, the, vi the digital and analog um, formative assessments interfere with each other. The, the VR goggles make it hard to see how the human taster is going to use that tasting. So could you generate an image in w that is consistent with human perception? And it gave me this, which is pretty good, right? And as I said, I put the, the AI in the background so you can see the core. Right. It knew why, it had a rationale for why I was doing this, right? Okay, so the, this is like, okay, the, it's easy to get distracted by the AI, but pay attention to the human, right? This is, this is formative assessment, this is what we do every day, right? We, we don't know what's inside the student's brain, we have to find out by asking the right questions, right? Worked examples, right? So, worked examples, uh, this is, uh, it sort of struggled with this a little bit. It got the idea of progression, that you, you show different, um, uh, uh, different subtle changes and the student learns over time, but, but it came back with something that wasn't, didn't actually have an example in it, right? So we had to talk it through a little bit. Um, and I've, I've left the image and the rest of these images weird. I haven't massaged them or talked to them because I want to remind you that this is a weird technology and that's what it is. It's not human. Right. This is when I, every time we talk through an example, we, I ask it for an analogy, I ask it to generate the image and I leave it. This is what it thinks. This is what it thinks it looks like for a good slide of worked examples. But worked examples are everything, not only in prompting, but in training AI. If you're training a generative AI, the ideal training material is, this is what the input looks like, this is what the output should look like, and here are some annotations about why that's good to help with. That's a worked example. And what you want to do is give it a bunch of those that are subtly different so that it can begin to differentiate. Right? That is how a generative AI is trained. Right? Now we're not just talking about prompt engineering. We're talking about the actual guts of what does it mean. And what we're learning is that the quality of the training data is way more important in some ways in terms of the AI's quality than how many freaking chips you put in or how complex the software is, right? If you want it to know what we know, you have to teach it what we know. Okay. Metacognitive prompting, right? So this, you know, I talked it through with this, and I've actually run this experiment before. I was curious, it brought this up. I said, well, what if, what if I asked you to generate a lesson and um, uh, I want you to think and reflect on that lesson for the students. You know, what would you ask for? I'm not going to read you the whole thing because I'm running long. Um, but it, you know, it gave me a long prompt that says, you know, check the alignment with learning objectives. Brought up smart learning objectives. Check engagement and appropriateness of comments, uh, content, assessment effectiveness, inclusivity, and diversity, clarity, and structure. I've run this experiment before, by the way. It actually does come back and say, you know what? When I generated that first lesson, even though you prompted me, uh, I missed assessing a certain portion of a learning objective. Do you want me to generate an assessment for that? Yes, I do. So it needs metacognition. This is a durable skill. Writing, right? All of this is written, right? We're, we're doing language, and, and this was interesting. I had a conversation, right? First, it, you know, was talking about the conductor as, as, uh, uh, as the, um, you know, as the writer, as the prompter. 
And then I said, well, the orchestra is important too. And I said, you're right, I was wrong before. I said, no, 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 you're not wrong. I said, it's an extension of the analogy, not a replacement. So it says, oh, you're right, the extension of the orchestra analogy, blah, blah, blah. Original idea, the orchestra's conductor is a writer or AI user harmonizing various elements or AI interactions. Extension slash consequence, the orchestra itself has the metaphor for generative AI with its diverse, and I put in scare quotes, instruments, parentheses, capabilities, and functions being guided by the quote unquote conductor, parentheses, user developer. And then it explains why that adds a layer of complexity, right? These are durable skills. What you do every day, these are durable skills. I don't know what's gonna happen, but I know every day when I get something useful out of one of these generative AI, it's because I'm using my teaching skills. Hmm. Now, there are other skills I'm gonna talk briefly in the last few minutes here um, about one project that I'm working on. You're all, I'm sure, given the number of hands that went up when I asked about what you're doing in generative AI, you're all doing projects, you're all experimenting, you're all doing what I'm doing, right? Or something, right? You're, you're all working on this because it seems big, right? So, ChatGPT is not a technology, it's a product. The technology is a large language model, which is a large model, mathematical model of a language. For the STEM folks in the room, it's vectors and matrices. Is this more like this or more like that? Is it more like this or more like that, right? So, you don't need to really understand that but what you need, do need to understand is that ChatGPT has a whole bunch of other technology wrapped, wrapped around that core model to do what it does. Just like D2L Brightspace has a whole lot of technology wrapped around that core database where all the information is stored and retrieved, right? And we need to understand like how useful is it? What is it else does it need for a particular purpose? And in my case, right, I'm running a a workshop series uh, for organizations, for, for universities and other organizations where, like, raise your hand if you have some kind of shortage of learning design talent. Like, okay, yeah, like most of you, right? There, if you have ambitions to, to, you know, keep up, you are going to have a shortage of learning design talent. And in the 50 years or more, the half a century or more that we've had learning design methodologies, the most popular tools for doing learning design in that first or and second iterations are word processors and spreadsheets that support human interviews. We have yet to build a tool that has caught on that is better than that, right? That's interesting. That tells us something. And we want to figure out what that something is. And could this conversational interface that then generates language based on what we tell it could that scaffold that process? Is that the missing piece? Is it that we're just approaching, that, that that interview process is the right process, and this tool could be an assistant, right? So we're doing minimum viable product in the, in the classic sense of the term. We're gonna test, you know, could, we're not gonna build this all the way out to something someone would buy, but you know, it's like, will you buy shoes online? That's a weird thing. Would you buy shoes online? Right? Okay, would you, would you use this instead of word processor and um, spreadsheet, right? So that involves iterative software development. And, and when you hear the word agile, 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 you know, when you're talking software development, so agile, agile. Agile is a, just a really well-developed, well-honed set of techniques for communication and collaboration and analysis, right? On um, for, for complex problems, that's what it is, right? So we are building uh, over a period of six months, six iterations. We're building a, a test of whether this tool will work. Those are durable skills, right? You can't know what's going to work until you try it, right? So um, I wish I have like three minutes for questions. I am on the internet. I'm, I, I'm in addition to all of this. Please, like, you know, if you want to contact me, just take a picture, reach me. I'm also on LinkedIn, which has become sort of the Twitter for sane people who are gamefully employed. Right? Um, um, 
you can reach me. I probably have time for one question. I'm going to hang around for the break, and then I'm sorry to say I've got to, I've got to run. I'm trying to get myself ready to go see my sister on Monday, who, by the way, actually, you know what? I'm going to ask you for something more important. I'm sorry to say, as important as you all are to me, my sister is more important. Um, so I've been filming this for her. Um, so I want to ask something of you. Sharon um, was a, 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 a um, microbiology major in college. She could have chosen to be a doctor. She chose instead to be a high school biology teacher. She's been working for decades in a very challenging district, fighting every day for those kids. I never saw her sag. I never saw her falter. She is a piece of steel, which is why I'm confident she's going to come out of this OK. She is, by the way, doing very well. They're in the process of getting ready to move to intensive rehab from the ICU. We don't know, we won't know for a long time whether she'll be able to make a quote unquote full recovery or what that means under these circumstances, but I believe she will make a full recovery. And I, yes, yes. And that is what I will ask for you. Sharon did what I'm doing five times a day, five days a week. And I don't think she ever got a round of applause. So I would really appreciate it if you would give a round of applause for my sister, the hero, Sharon Feldstein. It's time. I, I could take a question or two, but it's, uh, it's up to you. I don't know how we follow that up. Yeah, we okay. <laughs> okay. I do have a way of shutting down conversation. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, thank you all. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.